his deity and his role in uh, the inspiration of scripture. In fact, um, let me stop and point you, if you're in Hebrews still, if you'll look at Hebrews uh, chapter 3, verse 6. <clears throat> Hebrews 3, verse 6. But Christ was a faithful, Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Why is he saying that? Because they were tempted to disregard their Christian faith and turn back into Judaism. That's why I don't believe in an easy once saved, always saved. Yeah, I pray the prayer and I live like the devil, but when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I, I don't see that in Scripture. I see that I'm secure in my salvation. No question about that. God is not going to disown me, but I have to meet the challenge to end well. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Now watch this. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, notice that, that he's still speaking, but what, what is the writer of Hebrews doing? He is quoting the Psalms. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me. And what is he quoting? Which psalm is he quoting? Um, that's the problem with this Bible. I think Michael, psalms you and I talked about it. It doesn't have any references. I have to actually... My, my reference is Psalms 95.7. That's it. Psalm 95.7. But that was written by whom? It was written by David. Therefore, David is, is moving in his role as prophet. I just want to point out that the Hebrew writers is basically ascribing that to the Holy Spirit. Is he denying the authorship of David? No, but he's basically showing the, the partnership between the Holy Spirit and the human author. Um, let's see if I want to do another one. Let us go to... Um, Still speaking of the Holy Spirit, in Hebrews 4, 7, uh, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Why does he keep saying that? Because they're in danger of hardening their hearts. Why does he use David? Because David is, is authoritative in the Old Testament, but David is looking ahead to um, the day of the Messiah. Now, if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 28. Acts 28, the last chapter in the book of Acts. I want to trace the theology of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of his word. Acts 28, verse, um, let's, let's do verse 25. When they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah, the prophet, to your fathers saying, go to this people, what is he doing? He's quoting now from Isaiah. <clears throat> go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. That is, they are choosing not to understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. Why? For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Jesus quotes this as well in Matthew 13. Is God playing hard to get? No, he's not. What's happening here is God is saying, 
I want to reach you, but you will not allow me to reach you. Isaiah spoke this to his people at the time, and Paul is saying this, Isaiah is still speaking to this current generation. There is the masterful example of the twofold nature of prophecy, that it can speak to the original audience and that it can speak to a future audience as well, which it did to the Jewish people of Jesus' time, and there's even, in a sense, a triple fulfillment because it's still speaking to people today. God wants them to repent, but if they're hardening their hearts, he's not going to override their free will. So the history of the Old Testament itself had a prophetic viewpoint designed to show the Israelites whether they were being obedient to God's call to them to be his people above all the peoples of the earth. Remember Moses said, would to God that all of God's people would be prophets. See that? But how did they prophesy? They prophesied by the Holy Spirit. What is mind-boggling to me is I'm reading through 1 Samuel right now that I mentioned to you before that, that I counted at least 15 times where Saul or his soldiers tried to assassinate David. And in one of those times, Saul sends his men to assassinate David. When they come to Ramah, where David is with Samuel, they start prophesying. The Holy Spirit comes upon these men, and instead of being able to kill David, they start prophesying. God allows them to prophesy, and in that is saying to them, look at my grace that is preventing you from killing my servant. So that fails. So Saul sends another group of people. The same thing happens to them. The Holy Spirit comes upon them and they start prophesying. They cannot kill him. And in the grace of God, he allows these carnal-minded men to prophesy. Which tells me that just because God does anoint someone does not mean he approves of everything they do. And then Saul himself comes. And God is being patient with that man, patient with him, patient with him, patient with him. And the Holy Spirit comes upon Saul, and Saul prophesies. So that's the, I think that's the last time. And Saul hardens his heart again, and he goes after David again. And, that, and it was at that point, I think, seems like that the Holy Spirit said, that's enough. And now you've, you've sown your own destiny. <clears throat> So thus, Freeman explains, the word of God consists in just this. It is the prophetic testimony to what God has said and done and what he will yet do in history. So the role of the Holy Spirit in prophecy throughout the entire Old Testament is major and the role of the Holy Spirit in the entire New Testament is major. The, Paul and the apostles are trying to go into Asia Minor to do more missions work. And what happens? The Holy Spirit stopped them from doing it. And he moved them to go into Europe instead. What happens with Ananias and Sapphira? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. Everywhere you see in the New Testament, there's an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Not more than the Father and the Son, because the role of the Holy Spirit is always to exalt the Father and the Son, to point us to the Father and the Son. If we come away with the conclusion that therefore he's less than the Father and the Son, we have come into great error. What we have to see is within the Godhead, there's complete equality in terms of Godhead, but there are different functions and different areas of emphasis. But that's why I can never look at a child and say, well, look at me, I am a pastor, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, therefore I'm more important than that child, hmm. right? Or uh, to the to Leslie Bolger, who serves coffee on Sunday mornings. Well, I'm up here preaching. Let's say I'm preaching that day. 
And I walk out and I look at Leslie and I say, well, <clears throat> look at me. I'm more important than you. What I should see is that she is just as important as, as I am. She's serving an important function. She's serving in an administrative role. That's why Paul says the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The, the nose can't say to the foot, I don't need you. All parts of the body are necessary. We extrapolate from there to look at the Holy Spirit who is content in who he is to bring, not bring attention to himself, but point us to the Father and the Son. But the only way we can know the Father is through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He's, he is who enables us to call God Abba, right? It comes by the Holy Spirit. We can't say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We can't do anything in life except through the Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses when and only when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We can't even be born again apart from the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 9. So the role of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, is absolutely essential in every nook and cranny of the Christian faith. But why don't we pray to the Holy Spirit? I'm not aware of many verses at all in the Bible that call me to pray directly to the Holy Spirit. Is it wrong to pray to the Holy Spirit? No, because he's God. But why is the emphasis in prayer mostly on the Father and the Son? Because the Holy Spirit wants to glorify the Father and the Son. But we should never come away with the conclusion, therefore, that the Holy Spirit is less than. And that's the problem in the body of Christ. We treat him as less than, right? We focus mostly on the Father and the Son, as it should be without neglecting the Holy Spirit. You see that? That difference? There, the role of the Holy Spirit is essential throughout. In Genesis 1-2, he's right there. <clears throat> so we're, we're trying to understand the theology of the Holy Spirit even in the Old Testament. Um, paragraph number four, written from the prophetic viewpoint, the entire Old Testament is a history, primarily, but not only, of Israel that is purposeful and redemptive. Hence, Freeman asserts, the purpose of God in the history of Israel is, to the eye of faith, the clue to the history of mankind. The purpose of God in the history of Israel is, to the eye of faith, the clue to the history of of mankind. Remember what I said many times. God is a missionary God right there in Genesis chapter 12. In you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Uh, um, we are to be a light. Israel is to be a light to the nations. Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 60. I mean it just goes on and on and on. This is the theological emphasis of the prophets. That God as the Lord of history and providence was controlling the issues and movements of history for a purpose. With one voice, the prophets declare that this purpose toward which all history is being directed is the establishment of the kingdom of God, the sovereign reign and rule of God upon the earth. What happens? God gives Abraham a promise of land. Then he develops a nation through Abraham. The nation is delivered from Egypt, which prefigures our deliverance of sin, which is a type. What happens? He brings them into the promised land, which is a type and shadow of us, into the promised land. Why does he bring them into the promised land? To make them a nation. Why are they a nation? They, they, the Messiah is going to come through that nation who will redeem the world and God is going to be faithful to fulfill his promises to that nation. He's not done with them, but out of that nation he brings a, another nation, the Gentiles. And so it's through Israel 
that we are saved. Even though they're not walking with the Lord, well, Paul addresses that as well in Romans 9 through 11. Hey, 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 don't get arrogant and say now that because, you know, the, there's, you know, hundreds of millions of more Gentiles than there are Jews. See, we're better than the Jews. No, 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 Paul says. You're grafted into them. They're not grafted into you. And God is going to turn his attention back to Israel and all Israel will be saved. It's a both and, not an either or. But that all starts back at the beginning in Genesis where God reveals his heart to the nations and his ultimate eternal plan is that the kingdom of God is going to fill the whole earth, not this kingdom of Saudi Arabia, not the kingdom of the United States, not the kingdom of Great Britain, not Russia, not China, none of those. All of them are going to have their day, and one day a rock is going to come into that mountain and destroy all of man's kingdoms, and only his kingdom is going to prevail. That is where we're heading. And that is what God is preparing us for from Genesis to Revelation. Indeed, we see this in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. And Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be one and his name one. Clearly, the Old Testament is vital for Christians today. Amen. And how about that? Amen. We're stopping right at noon, and we finished, we even got in a little bit of an introduction on, on uh, the prophets. So we'll get into more of it next week, and then um, we're going to spend, Lord willing, we'll probably spend two entire Saturdays on Isaiah. And then the last Saturday, we'll get into, Lord willing, Ezekiel, since we're not getting to that in the notes, and we'll try to cover as much of that as we can. Praise the Lord. Good stuff. <laughs>